And if you are able to, would you stand with us? I'm going to begin the service by reading from Psalm 96, verses 7 through 10. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. Tell all the nations, the Lord reigns. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. He will judge all peoples fairly. And this is good news. Let's, yeah, let's celebrate the good news that God has given us today through song at first and then also through hearing his word preached later as well. So yeah, let's sing together. together. Cast my mind to Calvary, 
where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. Lord, in this days we will sing.
your glory is so beautiful I fall onto my knees in awe and the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your life cause your glory is so beautiful Your glory is so beautiful. My life is yours. My life is yours. My hope is in you only. And my to my knees I fall onto my and the heartbeat of my life is to worship
can have a seat. I'm going to invite Tolu up, and Tolu is going to lead us in a time of prayer together. Good morning, church. It's lovely to see everybody here today. Um, again, my name is Tolu Ajibola. I'm one of the elders here at West Village Church, and I'm going to lead in our congregational prayer this morning. Um, before I do that, um, just want to think about uh, this past week as we reflect on all the challenges and blessings, uh, the elections to the south of our border and the division that has caused, the ongoing conflicts in the world, the impacts of many natural disasters around us. I just want us to reflect on the word of God in Revelation, uh, which is praying for the return of Christ to encourage us this morning. So I'm going to read from Revelation 22, 14, 12 to 14. It says... Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robe so that they might have the right to the tree of life and that they might enter the city by the gates. Uh, in these verses, we see the promise that Christ makes that is coming soon promise to judge all things righteously. We also see Christ's sovereignty over all things and time. And we are rem reminded that true blessing is for those who have washed their robe of their sins in the blood of Christ, and that they will have eternal rest and peace with God in heaven. My hope for everyone today is that we know Christ is coming soon. We can have rest in the Lord's sovereign control over all things and have confidence in the future eternal peace for all who have placed their trust in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. 
Oh Lord, we come to you today as the one true God, our great shepherd with our prayers. We turn to you today as the one true and throned above all creation. We seek your rest and peace in this world of many troubles, trials, and tribulation. We ask that you shine forth with your power and glory in our midst and world today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the opportunity to freely gather here today to worship. We commit our fellow believers around the world who are also worshiping in spirit and truth. Whether they gather in peaceful setting as we have here today or in the midst of conflicts and persecutions for their faith, that all who worship today will be guided and led by your spirit to be pleasing to you. We think of the many ways we as individuals and corporately as a church have sinned against you and each other. We confess our sins and seek your forgiveness this morning. We trust that your word that says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And for those who have sinned against us, Lord, we ask that you empower us through your Holy Spirit to forgive them. Lord, you've also asked us to mourn for those who mourn and rejoice for those who rejoice. And so this morning we are praying for uh, the pastoral search team and elders as we continue in our search for a full-time pastor. We continue to pray for the next pastor, that God will continue to ready him and his family uh, to be part of this ministry at West Village Church. We pray for all those who are healed or healing uh, with so much healing that's going on around, and specifically for Krista. Uh, she's been battling the flu for a while. We also want to thank God and pray for Sharon's mom, Julie, who was admitted uh, to the stroke clinic. We pray for wisdom for the doctors who are treating her and thankful for the gift, uh, for, the, for the care she has received thus far. We want to pray for all the ministries here at West Village Church today, uh, from the worship team, the, the children's ministry, to the welcome team, and just all who have come to serve today. For our Lord, again, just continue to encourage them as they use the gifts which you've given them to bless your body. We commit the rest of the service today into your hand. We pray for Pastor Pran as he continues to preach through Revelation today, and that you give him the words to, to give to the, us today, and that through the Holy Spirit that we will be all drawn closer to you. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to invite Grace up to the stage now. She's going to read the passage for today. Revelation 21, 1 to 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a, as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the sexually immortal, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Thank you, Grace. Okay, all right, kids, it's time to go to your classes. So, thank you.
We're looking at the book of Revelation, in fact, the end of the book of Revelation. And there are seven blessings that are promised in this book. And the first one found in chapter one is a blessing for those who read it out loud. I want to read the entire passage together today. We've needed to break it up in order to look at it piece by piece. But I want to read the passage as a whole. Verses 1 to 8 have already been read. And I'll start at Revelation 21, verse 9 to 22, verse 5. So this is all one passage that flows together. Picking up the reading of verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall. 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. And the wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass." And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also On either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Here ends this reading of the word of God. Amen. Have you had the experience when certain people come into the room, they're like a presence in the room? I mean, other people come into the room, and it's almost like they're not there. 
But there are some people, I'm sure you've had this experience, where it just seems like they fill up the room. I remember when I was a student, we were part of a small group, and uh, three small groups came together for a Christmas celebration. I didn't know most of the other people. And this, this one woman came into the room, and it's like she filled the room with her gigantic smile and her loud hello. And what's interesting is the contrast, because her husband came in shortly after her, and you hardly even noticed him. He was happy just to sit down over in the corner there. But some people are like that. Have you had that experience? It's like they fill the whole room. And what if God came in? I think the main point of this passage that I'm looking at this morning, Revelation 21, 9, to the end of the chapter, I think the main point of this passage is that we will be in his presence, in the very presence of God. There's a lot that could be said. I'm going to organize my comments around this question. What would it be like to be in the presence of God? But stick with me because I have a surprise for you toward the end. What will it be like to be in the presence of God? Well, we can say, first of all, we'll experience the glory of his presence. Verses 9 to 11. Verse 9 says, one of the seven angels who had the seven last plagues. So this is John's spiritual guide for this part of the vision that he has. And probably refers to one of the angels from chapter 16, who pours out the bowl of wrath onto the earth. This bearer of God's judgment is now going to command John to see God's love for his church. And as he commands John to see the bride, the wife of the lamb, as the holy city, Jerusalem. And this is the, probably the same angel who in Revelation 17, 1, summoned John to come and to witness the judgment of the harlot. And John sees clearly the contrast of the wicked city of Babylon called the harlot and the great city of Jerusalem now that he comes to this point in the vision. In the words of Augustine, the city of God and the city of man. One city symbolizes all that is evil in our current world, and the other is the epitome of all that is beautiful and pure. And notice that John here's come. This is not an invitation. This is a command. It's an order to come. And the angel will show John the bride, the wife of the lamb. And it's interesting, as we come to the close of this book of Revelation, that that the lamb becomes so important. In these last two chapters, the lamb is mentioned seven times. And John sees what? He sees the holy city Jerusalem, which is the bride, the wife of the lamb, is the holy city Jerusalem. And we've already seen this in Revelation 21, 2 from last week. And that's where we read, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So remember this. We're going to come back to this. Verse 10. So John is taken up in the spirit. This is not physically, but it's a vision that he has. And he gets the perspective from a great high mountain, an excellent place to see all that happens. And what does John see? Again, the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And the fact that it's coming down out of heaven in and of itself signals that this is the work of God. This is not something that man can do. Man, for all of his effort, cannot do this. It's not an achievement of man. It's a gift from God. Verse 11, what does the city look like? It shone with the glory of God. Glory is what makes God God. Glory is the heaviness, the weight of God's self-manifestation when he makes himself known. And it's one of the most striking things about this new city. As John sees this holy city coming down out of heaven from God, it, it's like it glitters with a radiance. It shimmers, manifesting the presence and the glory of God. 
The city glows with the glory of God. God's divine spark sparkles in every part, even the smallest part of the city. The city radiates God's glory. The city's brilliance is from God himself. The glory is a manifestation of his presence. And the overall impression of the city is as a gigantic, brilliant, sparkling jewel. Well, John compares it to jasper, clear as crystal. Maybe for us, a diamond would be closer to what John saw. We need to remember that John is trying to describe what he saw and to relate it to what may be familiar to the people who first had this sent to them, to whom it was first read, who first um, heard it read out loud. However, it's evident that the revelation he receives transcends anything that can be experienced, let alone explained. And so notice that he uses like, 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 and as. He uses these similes trying to help us to, to grasp what he saw. The Jasper stone that we know today is opaque. It's not clear. It's found in various colors. John apparently was referring to the beauty of the stone. Today we might describe that city as a beautifully cut diamond, glimmering, glittering in the light. We will experience the glory of his presence. Second, we will experience the magnitude of his presence. Verse 12 to 17. So let's look at verse 12. In scripture in general, and especially in apocalyptic literature, you really need to notice repetitions. And numbers are also very important in apocalyptic literature. We are reading apocalyptic literature when we read the book of Revelation. In the French Bible, it's called the Apocalypse. In, in the English Bible, it's called Revelation. The Greek word is Apocalypse. The translation is Revelation. That's what we're reading here. And numbers are important. So notice the number 12. It's incredibly prominent. What do we have? 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 foundations, 12 apostles, 12 pearls, 12 kinds of fruit in chapter 22. The wall is 144 cubits, 12 times 12. The length, height, and width of the city is 12,000 stadia. Twelves. Twelve is the number that's often associated with completeness, fullness, and entirety. Now, there's a great wall, but the, the wall is not needed for defense because all opposition and danger is put aside, is put away, it's abolished. So perhaps, perhaps the wall is because this is part of, of what people would perceive as an ideal city. It isn't for us today. But up until fairly recently, cities were built with walls. You can visit Quebec City, and you can see the wall around the old city. That's the way cities were built. That was the perception of what, what was important in a city. And certainly the wall represents security. The 12 gates symbolize welcoming and bountiful entrance all the way around, three gates on either side. And the reference to 12 tribes as gates and 12 apostles as the foundation of the city emphasizes that continuity of the New Testament church with God's people of the Old Testament times. The unity between Israel and the church is shown in God's scheme of things. Old Testament saints, true followers of Jesus, those who look forward to the Messiah, and true followers of Jesus, make up this city. And the wall of verse 17 brings the same emphasis. It's a wall of 144 cubits. All right, 12 times 12. That's what's important. 12 tribes and 12 apostles. It's the same idea. So the actual thickness is 216 feet or 72 yards, which apparently for a city this size would be considered a really small wall. The significance of the measurement lies in the fact that it's that multiple of 12 and it has to do with the people of God in their eternal sanctuary. And then 12 angels at the gates. 12 celestial gatekeepers. And they may reflect Isaiah's picture of watchmen on the walls, Isaiah 62, 6. Perhaps they belong to the concept 
of an ideal city. I mean, imagine angelic gatekeepers who control all who go in and go out. But again, the gates are open. Like, there's no opposition. And so there isn't that need to control. Maybe they're there just to pass on God's blessing. Verse 15, 16, a measuring rod is used for measuring, which is approximately 10 feet. Wow, what do you think it's made of? Gold, of course. Everything in heaven is going to be made of gold. The measuring reminds me of Ezekiel's temple. In Ezekiel 40 to 48, there is a man who goes around measuring. Ezekiel's reed is not gold. Well, the measuring angel, he goes around and he is, he's measuring, and I think it, it portrays the enormous size and the perfect symmetry of the eternal dwelling place of the faithful. 12,000 stadia. The 12 is really important. However, we translate it into something we understand, 1,400 to 1,600 miles. But we can't lose the significance of the 12, the 12,000. It's a number of completeness, a number of, of fullness. So if we try and translate it into today's sort of language so we can understand, so we'll say it's 1,500 miles long and wide. The total area of the city then is 2,250,000 square miles. The city would stretch from London to New York, London to Athens, New York to Houston, and at 2,250,000 square miles, it would be uh, 10 times as big as Germany, uh, 40 times as big as England. It's just to give a perspective on what's being said here. I think this is the point. It is too large for our imagination to take in. The city is a place of splendor and room. There's room for everyone, big enough for all of the people of God. There's no crowding in heaven. He calls out to everyone to come to him, to come to Jesus, to come to this city. Big enough for everyone, but there's only one way to get into this city, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way into this city, and that's Jesus. We're given more dimensions. So the the city, verse 16, lies four square. Well, that seems to be a common way that cities were laid out. Apparently, Babylon and Nineveh were also a square. But it's not just a square. It's a cube. It's as high as it is long and wide. A perfect cube. But where else do we find a perfect cube in the Bible? You're right. The tabernacle. A perfect cube. Temple. The Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies in the temple, a perfect cube. There's a perfect cube. We think of these other Holy of Holies and where they're found, and, and we need to think that the perfect cube, the holy city of the New Jerusalem, is it's the new Holy of Holies. The new Holy of Holies, the whole city is the new holy of holies, the place of divine presence, the place where God dwells. Since it is the new Jerusalem, it's also the place where God's people dwell in perfect fellowship with God and each other. So John is struggling just to show us the the vastness of what he saw, the perfect symmetry and the, the splendor of the new Jerusalem. The whole city is sacred space we'll experience the glory of his presence. We'll experience the magnitude of his presence. We'll experience the beauty of his presence, verse 18 to 21. So the wall is made of jasper. The city is pure gold. But we mustn't get too caught up with with designation for individual gems, and this means that, and, and, and this means this, because in actual fact, about half of the gems, we don't know really what they are. So the translators translate into something you understand, and they think this is probably what it is. But the way uh, gems are, are named in today's world is different than in John's world. 
What's underlying is that even the city wall, in all of its beauty, speaks of the glorious presence of God. 19 to 21, the beauty of the city maybe have a symbolic meaning. No clue is given as to the precise meaning. Since it's reasonable to assume that the saints would draw in the city, it's best to take the city as a literal future dwelling place of the saints and the angels. But that's not all there is to it. The 12 gems remind us of the breastplate of the priest that he would wear. And so it seems now only the high priest, not the priest, the high priest would wear this breastplate into the Holy of Holies. And he went, it reminded him of the tribes whom he represented and and whom he represented to God. But now, now, all of God's people enter the Holy of Holies. And each gate is a single pearl. Hmm. Verse 21, is it a mark of affluence? I mean, imagine a pearl large enough to be a city gate. It, it boggles your mind. Again, I'm thinking of the old city in Quebec um, and the wall that's around it and the size of the gates. It, it just it boggles my mind, a single pearl. Maybe it emphasizes the great wealth and generosity of God as people enter his city. The city street is made of gold so pure that it seemed to be transparent as glass. And the servants of God walk on the streets of gold. Challenges our concept of what we consider to be precious. Gold is one of the precious metals. We consider it to be precious. We make wedding rings out of it and other precious things. And the new Jerusalem? Huh. Paving stones. That's all it's worth. All your gold, that's what it's worth. Paving stones. Compared to the beauty of the entire city. So here's what we can say. The overall picture is of a city of brilliant gold surrounded by a wall inlaid with jasper and precious stones of every color and hue. And the city is magnificent beyond description. As the eternal dwelling place of God and his people It's described in language which continually attempts to break free of the limitations of the language in order to do justice to what it's describing, what it's also imperfectly describing. We will experience the glory of his presence. We will experience the magnitude of his presence. We will experience the beauty of his presence. And we will experience the glory of the presence of Jesus. Verse 26 to 22, 22 to 26. And I saw no temple in the city. Whoa, whoa, that is so astonishing. John is a Jew. John will no doubt be very familiar with Ezekiel's prophecy and the last chapters of Ezekiel in which Ezekiel portrays this incredible temple and also the land and how it will be divided. And now, I mean, he sees a vision and there's no temple there. I mean, put yourself in John's shoes while or his sandals, you know, as a Jew of that time. Hard to imagine. No temple. Astonishing. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. So unlike Ezekiel, who spends chapters describing the restored temple and his ordinances, John sees no temple. Now here's what we need to understand. The earthly physical temple is a symbol in many ways. Now Ezekiel expects his very description of the temple. He makes it clear in his prophecy that as he describes the temple, that when people hear, read this this description, they'll be convicted in their hearts and they'll repent and they'll turn back to God. That's his expectation just in describing the temple. The temple is replaced by the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And this is what the earthly temple was meant to point toward in the first place. 
So in eternity, the presence of God the Father and the Lamb permeates and sanctifies all that, that heavenly Jerusalem symbolizes. There will not be one millimeter of heaven that does not display and does not declare glory to God, glory to God. Look at verse 23. Like, where's all this glory coming from? New Jerusalem doesn't need a sun or a moon to shine it. Well, please note, it doesn't say there'll be no sun and be no moon. It just means those things are not needed to give light. They're not needed. They won't, they won't shine. Why? For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamp. This is how great the glory of God is. But wait. Where's all this glory coming from? Notice how the lamb is put on the same level with God as the source of light for this city. It's an incredible affirmation of the work and the person of Jesus, equal to God in glory. Verse 24, the glory of the Lamb draws the nations to the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Nations. We read earlier in the book of Revelation, Revelation 9, 7, verses 9 and 10. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, will be a, a place of gathering for the nations, a dwelling place for all the saints, of all ages, and for angels, and, and God himself, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Nations, Israel, the church, all together. Look at verse 25, 26. The gates will never be shut by day, and there'll be no night there. While the gates are not really needed for security. But through these gates, when the, gate, the gates being open, and open all the time, and it's 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 daytime all the time through these open gates the kings of the earth will bring glory and honor the choices of the earthly treasures but what could add to the splendor of this city nothing can be added and so what we have is a symbol of homage to the king the great king of kings and the Lord of Lords. And the Old Testament prophets also pointed ahead to this very same thing where the nations, the nations would bring all these treasures to Jerusalem. The glory and the honor of the nations implies cultures, creativity, civilizations that go with the nations. We come from different nations right here this morning. A part of who you are from that nation has to do with, with your culture, your creativity, the civilization that you represent. Well, there's something else we need to say. Fifth, some will experience the separation from his presence. Look at verse 27. But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, there's a division. Heaven is not the default location of every person. There is a division that's happening here. There's a contrast. Unclean, detestable, false, because of the absence of Jesus in their lives. In contrast to those who have their name written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, let's be honest. Unclean is every one of us without Jesus. Every one of us. Detestable, false, that's every one of us without Jesus. And so that's the contrast that's being put forward here. You see, it's in Jesus that we're made clean. It's in Jesus that we're made acceptable before God. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's all because of Jesus. 
And your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. The difference is having Jesus in your life and your life in Jesus. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Okay, here's the surprise that I promised you. So, you ready for it? The fact is, this, this is you, West Village Church. What we've been talking about. What will come in its fullness at a later time, nonetheless, this is you. The description of this beautiful city in Revelation 21 is you. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, is not just some city at a future date. No, it's a metaphor for the bride of Christ. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, is the bride of Christ. And that's made clear in verse 2 and verse 9. So we, West Village Church, are not only looking forward to the holy city, the new Jerusalem, as the new earth on which we will live, we, the church, are the holy city today. The presence of the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb is not just in some place future and far away from us. The presence of the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb is in us here and now. New Jerusalem doesn't have a temple. The purpose of the tabernacle and the temple was not just sacrifices, but the presence of God. Heaven invaded earth in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. Heaven invaded earth in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. Heaven invaded earth in the form of a little baby born to Mary. And she called him Jesus. And heaven invaded earth for every one of you that asked Jesus to come into your life. And he came into your life. At that point, heaven invaded earth in your life. Paul says that we, it's plural, he uses you all, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16, again, it's plural in this passage. Paul also says, Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's that word glory, it's found so much in the passage that we've been looking at today. We are the temple. Christ is in us. The presence of his glory is in us. Not only heaven invades us with the presence of Jesus in our lives, but his glory invades us as well. And that's an invasion we're very happy to receive. So Paul explains that this happens in the here and now through the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.18, he writes, We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It comes from the Spirit. As a result, we have this glory in us now. 2 Corinthians 4, 6-8. For God said, let the light shine out of darkness. It has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge, not head knowledge, heart knowledge, relational knowledge, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Verse 7, he says, but we have this treasure. What treasure? That relational knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So imagine, clay pots. But the idea here is cracked clay pots. And so the glory of God in that pot shines out through the cracks. I'm a cracked pot. You're all cracked pots, but that's a good thing because God's glory shines out through the cracks in our life. That's what Paul is talking about here. We are the temple in the new earth as well, the new Jerusalem, the holy city, the bride of Christ. I mean, West Village, you are the new Jerusalem, the holy city, not just sometime in the future, but now, imperfectly, yes. But now, West Village, 
You are the beautiful bride, the overwhelming, beautiful city, even now. Have you met someone who was beautiful? I mean, everybody would say, this person is beautiful. I mean, most people are just normal, right? But have you met someone who's beautiful, but all they can see are their flaws? And so you think to yourself, have you looked in the mirror recently? <laughs> but all they see are their flaws. We, the church of Jesus Christ, are beautiful in the Lord's eyes. We are his bride. He sees us as, as beautiful. All the potential, the beauty, and, and the glory of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, will be us, and in some part is us now. We are beautiful. But do you see it? Or do you just see the blemishes of the church? We all see the blemishes of the church. We know that. We're part of it. But is that all you see? Just the blemishes? Jesus loves his bride. Jesus loves the church even here and now. Jesus is committed to seeing his bride, seeing his church, seeing this particular church, West Village Church, become beautiful in reflecting his glory. So where does that leave us? I mean, what, what's our takeaway this morning? Well, here's the first thing. Worship is inevitable. When we grasp this, when we grasp what this chapter is saying, what it means for us even here and now, our normal response is worship. Worship the God who is the source of all of this. And not only that, worship together. Worshiping during the week in smaller groups or just personal worship is really important. And in fact, it prepares you to come together on Sunday morning to worship together. But what's being talked about in this passage, it's, it's plural. It's, it's the group together. There's something special about all of us coming together on Sunday morning to worship the Lord. And that... That's just the normal response when we reflect on what he has done, is doing, and will do in our life together. Personal lives, yes, but not just our personal lives, our, our life together. The well, second, the point of the book of Revelation and this passage is to help us endure. Do you need encouragement this morning? I mean, that's the point of this book, the point of these passages. It's meant to give us a vision of who we are now and what we will be. Like some days can be difficult. They can, they can really be difficult maybe because of um, sickness or illness that you're suffering from. They can be diff difficult because of other people in your life. They can be really difficult because of the toddler in your life. Some days are like that. And some lives can seem hardly worth living. That's the way some people see it. And then we look at Jesus. We look at how Jesus sees us, and we look at our destiny. It's, this is meant to encourage us. Keep your eyes looking up on the things above, and it transforms the journey here below. We can say also, understanding the passage, I mean, as far as we can, helps us to seek his presence here and now. I think it's what it's all about, seeking his presence. If you seek me, you'll find me, the Lord says. Seeking his presence here and now. God is, I mean, everywhere. But I'm talking about intentionally seeking his presence in and around us, even your everyday life, in your here and now, as you go to work tomorrow, as you go through your week or what, wherever you go, we're encouraged to seek his presence. And then finally, it helps us to look for glimpses of the new creation, glimpses of the, the new earth, the new heaven, the holy city, Jerusalem, here and now in our everyday life. I mean, 
Where, where do you see heaven breaking through into your everyday life? How often do we miss it just because we're not looking for it? And what about in acts of kindness, acts of courtesy, acts of practical love? But I want to end with a personal story. Most of you know that Susan and I went to visit her mother in September. And while we were there, she became very ill and went into the hospital. She was in the hospital a total of about three weeks. Well, after being there just a few days, she became delirious. She was talking, but talking nonsense. She was just kind of looking, laying in her bed, looking up, talking to someone, some people who were up there. She totally lost touch with reality. And with us, she was convinced, convinced we had stolen her away. We were hiding her in the back of a car in the parking lot of the hospital and wouldn't let her go into the hospital. She was convinced of that. That went on for four days. And toward the end of the afternoon on the fourth day, the pastor from her church came. And um, he's a senior pastor. He knows her well. And he sat down really close to her so she could hear to her head. And he read Psalm 46. And when he finished reading Psalm 46, she said, Amen. That was the first intelligent word she had mentioned in four days. And then we sang some songs together, four songs together. Uh, three of them were uh, older hymns that she knew. One was a more contemporary song that she knew. And this woman who had said nothing understandable until that amen in four weeks, she sang all the words. She didn't have the words in front of her. She knew all the words. She sang all the words. Amazing. So what's happening? Her brain is still scrambled. But her spirit is responding to the Holy Spirit. In hearing the word of God read and in singing those songs that affirmed her faith. It was amazing. And as I think back on it now, it really was. It was heaven invading earth. And then she went to sleep. And she slept all that evening. She slept all the next day and all the next night. And she woke up. About 36 hours later, she woke up, and one of the first things that she said was, why am I still here? <laughs> she wanted to be in heaven. <laughs> she wanted to be with the Lord because to be with the Lord is even better. But even here and now, we can seek his presence. We can, we can get those glimpses of heaven invading earth as we look around us. And we can be so encouraged by this passage. And we can worship. And that's what we're going to do right now. If you're able to, would you stand with us? fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity there will be a day when all will bow before And 
And every prayer we paid in desperation, the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, you'll see. Join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. With one voice, a thousand generations sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Whoa. You can have a seat for a couple of moments. I want to give you a, uh, just a few announcements. I have the best one in my back pocket here. So Elaine and Nathan have had a child. Yes. Um, I don't have the date. When they were here last, it was supposed to be the next day. Oh, yesterday, a little past the due date. Okay, so um, the girl's name is Isabel Anna Marie Ganey. It's their last name, of course. Seven pounds, 11 ounces. So that's, uh, that's a lot of joy. And we have some more coming up. Okay, just to remind you of a couple of things. There's um, a games night this Friday night uh, held at the church office. Um, it's for everyone. It's for adults and children just to get together and have some fun together. And then the next morning at 10 a.m., Saturday, November 16th, at the Westminster Presbyterian Church, 
the um, ladies will have a women's ministry brunch and Bible study. And we have one more membership course coming up. It'll be the second week in December. Just want you to be thinking about that. Um, one more course this year, and we encourage people to show your commitment to the Lord, to this church, through an official membership. It's saying, hey, we're one together here. I'm committed to this. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of the Father, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.